praise the Lord in this house this morning. There's freedom here. There's grace here. There's mercy here. Praise the name of Jesus. The Lord is good. Isn't that great music? That's great worship, isn't it? Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you so much. Y'all blessed us today. Who's, who's going to win the Super Bowl? They don't know. They're very confused. It doesn't really matter in here, does it? We're just happy about what Jesus is doing in our lives. Turn to two or three people and welcome them. We welcome all of our campuses, all of you online. We're so thankful that you're joining us live right now. Thank you for being a part. God bless you. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Psalms 121, and we'll go there in just a moment. And we'll go to the book of Esther chapter 6 also in just a moment. But it's pretty exciting what, what God is doing in our, in our lives today. I, I tell you, the first service, the presence of the Lord was really strong in this room. And I just think that today is a very special day. I know that um, I know there's a lot going on in our nation, and today is a celebration day and a family fun day. But look at this place. It's, I'm just proud that you know people aren't distracted. They they're making the main thing the main thing, and um, you know, and that's just powerful. And a lot is taking place. And I believe God has a word in season today for every one of you. As a matter of fact, I changed my message uh, yesterday. I had what I was going to preach and I and, uh, thought I had it and uh, was ready to go. And I felt like something shifted in my heart yesterday. And I knew that this was a word in season. And I want to talk to you today on a subject that is pretty wide ranging, but I think all of us can relate to it. I want to talk about the remedy to worry, the remedy to worry. And I want to go in the scriptures in just a few moments. And I want to tell you an Old Testament story of how our God is able to bring the remedy to worry in your life. How many of you, if you were to be totally honest today, would have to say, I do worry and I have something that I'm worrying about specifically. When I say that, it comes to your mind instantly. Let me see your hand. You worry about it. So this, this I believe, is a word in season for so many of you who are at all of our campuses and those of you online also. Um, I want you to be praying this week for our nation. I want you to be praying for me. Um, I Friday had an invitation come from the White House and I'm going to be Wednesday night at the White House and then Thursday I'll be at the prayer breakfast. Uh, but Wednesday night we're going to have dinner, myself and two other ministers and two congressmen, the vice president and myself, will have dinner um, together. And it came out of nowhere, it came unexpected, but not to God. And I'm loading myself up with the word because he knows if he's got me, I'm going to say something about Jesus sooner or later. I've never been in a meeting with him that I don't. And we'll see what God's doing. I don't know what's going on, but I feel, I feel like, I feel like God is in control. And I'm praying, praying for God to help our nation in a mighty, mighty way. So be in much, much prayer, especially Wednesday night. I want to go to uh, the scripture, Psalms 121. I want them to throw it, throw it up on the screen. You will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. That's it. The remedy to worry. I want to begin by telling you the story in the Old Testament. I, I, on the fast, tried to read the Bible through. I didn't get it done. But I, I've been reading, on average, about 10 chapters a day, sometimes 20, sometimes 40, on my real spiritual days. But 
But uh, it's been a great challenge, but boy, it's been the most, I don't know, it's just reading the raw word is the greatest thing for your spirit and your soul. Honestly, I cannot underscore how powerful it is to just, you know, and I hear this little voice in my head. I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but I'm not. I know where I'm going. I can get there quick. You're going to get out in plenty of time. I'll go 25 minutes from now. So just relax. Just relax. But there's something about knowing I'm supposed to be reading 20 chapters a day, and I know I'm not going to do it. But the fact that it's there, when I sit down and I come home from work or whatever, and you just want to go into TV and watch the news or something, and a voice, a little voice says, you hadn't read your Bible yet. Have you, have you ever heard that voice? It's just so annoying, and yet it's good to have that kind of pressure on you, right? So anyhow, y'all are so spiritual. You don't ever have that voice. You holy, how great thou art. How great thou art. Pray for me. But the book of Esther, I read through the book of Esther a few days ago. Man, it just is such a powerful story. The book of Esther is centered around King Aharis. Uh, Aharisus. He is the one who inherited the throne ultimately from Nebuchadnezzar. You remember the Jewish people were taken captive and became slaves, the smartest, the, the, the most brilliant. The rest were slaughtered. The city of Jerusalem was left desolated and destroyed. And uh, now for many generations, um, the, the Babylonians have ruled over the Jewish people. They basically were their slaves. And... This king, Ahasuerus, who is mean and he's a pagan and he is ungodly. There's nothing about him that seeks the Lord. He's, he's just, he is what he is. And um, he, to show you how mean he is, when his wife, who was the queen, would not dance for the princes that the king had brought in and wined and dined them for three days and in the conclusion, he wanted his queen to come out and do a vulgar dance, and she refused to do it. And the Bible said that he removed her from being queen. We don't know if he killed her or if he banished her, but which she's never heard of again. He replaced her by having a beauty contest. And he has 120 provinces in Babylon, and he says, find the prettiest girl in every province and send her to a beauty contest in Babylon, and the one who's the most beautiful uh, is the one that will be my new queen. And as God would have it, there is a little orphan girl by the name of Esther who was in one of those provinces, and she was beautiful. And um, she she is nominated as one of the potential choices of the king. And out of all the beautiful girls, at some point, it wasn't about hips and lips and all of that. At some point, and, and this is so interesting, I want you to lean in now. The book of Esther is the only book in the Bible God's name is never mentioned. Not one place, nowhere is God, any of his Hebrew names, Elohim, any of the Old Testament names, Every other book in the Bible is full of God's names. None of them can be read without multiple times of, of encountering God's name. But the book of Esther is the only book where God's name is not seen. And yet you see his fingerprints all over this story, which is a powerful lesson that there are seasons in our life when God can't easily be seen, but even when you can't see him, he's working. And even when you can't feel him, and even when the enemy is plotting, and even when the night is dark, and even when it seems like there's no way out of the situation, and you're worrying, I promise you, and God's silent, and God's nowhere to be found, and his name's nowhere in the middle of my crisis and my situation, you will find that he's all over it. But sometimes he goes undercover. Such is the case, and so she wins, Esther wins the beauty contest, and I'm just going to tell a story today, and I'll, I'll, we'll go where we're going, I'll get there quickly. And uh, she becomes his queen, but we almost make it like Esther is some huge 
huge heroic figure in this story. She was terrified. She was terrified of this man. He was brutal. Life meant nothing to him. And, it, and, and, and she was so terrified, as we'll see later in this story, that she was afraid to even go into his presence without being invited. She was afraid he would take her life. So there was no joy in this marriage. There was no relationship of, of, of you know, uh, romance and all of that. It was a brutal, he was a brutal, evil man, and she's forced to marry him. Then we move into chapter two, and there's only six chapters in the book, but we move into chapter two, and, and amazingly, um, amazingly, in chapter two, Mordecai, her uncle, is the only relative. Her parents have been killed, and she is the, she's an orphan, but she does have one relative. Her uncle's name is Mordecai, and Mordecai is at the gate, and he is there by chance, there again, God is working and orchestrating. And he's a Jew. The Bible calls him Mordecai the Jew. And the only reason he's there is because he had something to offer the Babylonians, some wisdom, some knowledge, some talent, or they wouldn't have kept him alive. But he's there and he happens to be at the gate. And there's a lot of activity at the gate in the Bible. It's where they made decisions and judges ruled and all kinds of things at the gate of the city. And he just happens to be there on this particular day. And he overhears a conversation of two of the Bible bodyguards of the king. And they are talking about an assassination plot that they are part of, that they're going to be the ones who are going to take the king's life. And he can't believe what he's hearing. He goes to Esther, his niece, and he tells her there is an assassination attempt about to be made on the king and you need to know it and you need to warn. And apparently she was afraid to go to him personally she tells somebody, we're not told who she tells, they spoil the assassination attempt, they kill the bodyguards, they root out all of the people who were conspiring and of course deal with them in the most brutal terms. But this person, whoever it was, took the credit and never told the king that it was Mordecai the Jew who had saved his life through Esther, his queen. And so it's an interesting moment when you understand that there's one other major character that I need to introduce, and his name is Haman. Haman is King Hazarias's um, prime minister. He's second in command. He's very powerful, listen carefully, and he's brutal, and he's just as mean as the king. Many scholars believe he was the one who got the news, protected the king, wiped out the conspiracy to kill the king, but he never told the king. He did it like I am the one who saved your life, and therefore he built even more credibility with the king. And now, as he's riding through the city, this, this prime minister, he's not the king, he's one notch under the king, and he's riding through the city on his chariot. The king is very pleased with him, and all the people have been taught to bow down, but that old Jewish man named Mordecai will not bow. And out of all of the people bowing, one, you know, if one person while I'm preaching in this room just stood up and tried to stand up, I, would, I, I can't help. Please don't. Well, we got ushers with stun guns. Don't try it. Don't try it. But, but, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, if you stood up, I would notice that. This is the funniest story to me that out of all the tens of thousands that were bowing, all that Haman could notice was that one Jew. And you know why he wasn't being rebellious? He had been taught for, since a child that we only bow our knee to the king of glory. We don't bow down. And, and he was, it was an act of worship for him. And it so bothered Haman that this powerful man would go back to his palace and he would go in and talk to his wife about it. The Bible said he actually made the comment, I would like to kill him with my bare hands. I can't stand that Jew, the Mordecai. I can't stand him and I want to kill him with my bare hands. All right, now we're going somewhere. Watch this. And sure enough, he decided one day, 
I'm going to exterminate all the Jews. I'm going to kill them. And he goes to the king and he gets permission from the king. Again, a brutal man, the king and now his prime minister. And the prime minister comes to the king and he says, you know, these Jews, they really helped us. We, we squeezed all of the wisdom, all of their inventions, their intellectual property, everything we've taken from them. We've learned everything we can learn from them. They're disposable to us. They're multiplying. They actually could be a threat. And I think we ought to kill them. And the king says, sounds reasonable to me. Kill them all. What are we going to have for lunch? That's, that's literally how these guys, they're that cold and that brutal. And the decision is made almost afterthought. Yeah, just exterminate on, on a certain day, all of the Jews will absolutely be exterminated. And all that Haman is thinking about is I can't wait to kill that one that I can't stand named Mordecai and Mordecai hears the story. And when he hears the story, he goes to his niece in the palace, the queen and he says, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You have to go in there and you have to speak up and you have to. And, and she and she she's not a hero. She's not. Yes, I will. I'll go boldly before the throne. She's not at all. She's trembling. She even brings this point up. She says, I cannot go in for the law has said whosoever shall enter uninvited shall be shall surely die. And Mordecai basically has to remind her, you are, and I want to preach right here a minute. You are not a whosoever. You are the bride of a king. You are, you can have what other people can't have. You can go where other people can't go. You can ask what other people can't ask for because you are not a whosoever. Quit acting like a whosoever. Quit asking like a whosoever. Quit asking like you don't have a right to go in boldly and ask. You are the bride of the king. And what a message to you and I today. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen and generation. You are a peculiar people and you are to come boldly into the throne of grace. Say, I'm not a whosoever. I am a part of God's royal family. The King of Kings knows my name. She's trying to work up the courage and finally, 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 knowing that she, she said fast for me and everybody goes on a three day fast. And after three days, see this, she's a normal person. She's filled with worry. She's filled with anxiety. She's filled with, oh my God, this is horrible. And they're fasting and they're praying. And after three days, her courage is worked up enough. And she, she, like a mouse is kind of tiptoeing into the presence of the King. And when he sees her, he holds holds out the scepter and she comes in and he says, what do you want Esther? And why have you approached me? And she, and she didn't have the nerve. She didn't have the nerve to say it. So she speaks up and she says, uh, I, I, I want you to come to a banquet to, tonight. I want you, and, and I think because Haman was on her mind, she's, I, I, and Haman, oh, I want Haman. You and Haman come. You and Haman come to a banquet. I think she was just buying herself time. She could have cut straight through the chase. She didn't have the courage to do it. She was just buying time. And she walks out of there and wipes her brow and says, oh my God, I thought he was going to kill me right then. She has this huge dinner prepared. And Haman and the king come, these brutal, mean, wicked men, and they're sitting there and she's there and she's, she's trying to figure out how she's going to bring it up and they eat and she wines them and they drink. And I'm sure they were full of the King's wine and it was a big night and it was an enjoyable night. And knowing Haman, like he's presented in the scripture, he's like, I am so special. 
I was the only one invited. There are no other princes from the other 120 senators and provinces. None of them have been. Look at me. Look at me. I'm sure all over his Instagram were pictures of the, you know, you know, you know. And he's like, look, I want every, and the word was spreading all outside. My goodness. Look at, look at Haman. He, he, he's the only one that's eating with the king and queen. He's a big deal. And so that night when he walks out of the palace after that party, it was so great and grand and all the people have heard him. The moment they see him, the paparazzi are outside. The news is outside. They're all bowing down except for that Jew. He's standing there. And it messed him up so bad that he goes home and he goes in the bedroom and gets in the bed with his wife and he starts pouting. This is in your Bible. You ought to read it. It's a cool book. And, and he's in the bed with his wife and he says, Mordecai, Mordecai didn't bow. Even after I had dinner with the king and the queen, he didn't bow. And his wife says, you know what? Didn't you tell me that they, that you were invited because at the end of that meal, the king turns to Esther and says, what do you want? Why did you do this? This was amazing. We had a great night. What do you want, darling? And she says, I, I want another meal tomorrow night. That's in your Bible. She didn't have the nerve. And so he goes home and he says, yes, they asked me to come tomorrow night. Just me, the king and the queen. And she said, you should take advantage. After tomorrow night, you're going to be so tight with them. Y'all going to be best friends like never before. Just at the end of the meal, just raise the issue of Mordecai and say that you want to kill him even before you kill the rest of the Jews and we'll be done. And she said, honey, in order to be ready for that, let's go on and start building the gallows for him to be hung from tonight, all night. By this time tomorrow night, it had to be 50 cubits high, which is about 75 feet. It was a big spectacle. And so he says, that's a great idea. Now you need to understand that the prime minister's palace was next to the king's palace. And in the backyard is where they would build this gallow. And so all night long, hammers are going bam, 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 bam. And they're building something back there, 70 something feet high. And that's where we move in. And I, 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 I got to take my time. Can I, can I take my time and just preach a minute? B because this is so important. This is so important. So this is the atmosphere now. This is the atmosphere. For Esther, she's panicking. She's worried. She's going to bed that night terrified that I still haven't spoke up for my people and those babies, those women, all the Jews, my uncle, all, the, all my friends. They're going to be slaughtered and it's all on me. And she's worried, worried, worried. It's an atmosphere of terror. It's an atmosphere of fear. It's an atmosphere of anguish and anxiety and worry and, and evil is winning and the night is dark and Esther's not confident. She's not bold. She's not brave. She's trembling in her, in, 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 in all that is on her. She's afraid the gallow. She can hear the pounding of the hammers. Something's about to happen. Somebody's about to die. Somebody is going to start this massacre of the Jews and it's near the weapon is being formed. He didn't say the weapon wouldn't be formed in Isaiah 54. He said, even while they're forming it, I won't let it prosper. And they're plotting. And, and, and that night when they go to bed, they're, ter they're terribly worried. And then you come to Esther chapter six and verse one. This is where I've been working to. And that night, the king could not sleep. So he commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles and they were read before the king. That night, the king could not sleep. Everything is bad. 
Everything is messed up and getting worse. Everything is hopeless. Everything is filled with anxiety and worry. They're facing a slaughter. She's scared to death. And the only thing that saved their life was that night the king could not sleep. Might I throw this in there? That unseen God whose name's nowhere in the book, I believe with all of my heart, he gave the idea to that wife to tell that husband to build the gallows. Do you know why he can't sleep? All he hears behind his palace is bam, 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 bam. Hammers, hammers, hammers. He can't sleep. And had he slept, they all would have died. But that night, the king can't sleep. He's tossing, he's turning, he has insomnia. And he calls and he says, I know what'll make me sleepy. Open the history books. The chronicles are nothing but history books. It's like reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, who in the world wants to hear? In, in every part of the king's life, everything concerning every detail, they had what they called uh, writers and they had people who, who did recorders and they didn't have recording devices. So they wrote down everything. And on the day, watch this now on the day when Mordecai overheard the bodyguards, somebody in the palace who was recording heard that conversation and wrote it as a footnote in the history books buried down on page 13,098 is a sub thought down at the bottom. This was the day when Mordecai the Jew heard about bodyguards who were going to kill the king and he told Esther and Esther told somebody and all the plot was spoiled. The king had never heard the story. Now watch, y'all got to see this. Let me preach. Look up here at me. Watch when you think God isn't working, when God's silent, where his name is nowhere to be found, where you don't feel victory and you don't feel faith and God's not saying nothing and nothing, heaven is silent and where are you when I need you so bad? My family's falling to pieces. My children are making terrible decisions. God, I've fasted, I've prayed. Where are you? You're saying nothing. I promise you the king can't sleep. He who keeps you will not slumber nor sleep. Watch this. And he says, uh, uh, I'm so sleepy, blurry eyed. He's sitting up there in his royal PJs on the throne eating cookies and milk and his hair's all disheveled and he's just sitting up there and he says, tell the recorder to bring the book. And the, yes, sir, what would you like for me to read? And he said, he said, he says, just, just, just open it anywhere. And in the, out of all the places, the pages could have, could have failed. I want to preach just a minute. There's an invisible finger that's already sticking in that book saying, now, when he opens the book, it's going to fall to the very day that Mordecai reported about the assassins. You worrying about stuff and you don't understand your king has been up walking the floor more than you've been walking. He's planning more than your enemy's planning. He's plotting your victory more than the devil's plotting your defeat and your demise. You serve a God who said no weapon formed against you will prosper and every tongue that rises up, he'll take care of them because the king can't sleep. And in that night, that reader just happen chance opens it and starts reading about Mordecai the Jew who saved his life. And the king says, wait a minute. What was done to reward that man? Has he ever come and tried to tell me this story? No, sir. He didn't want any credit. No, sir. Has he ever, has he ever asked for a reward? No, sir. My goodness, he did it with no motive. I want to reward that man. What's happened to that man? Nothing, sir. Nothing was done to reward him. Nothing. 
Oh my goodness. Now he's got off the throne and he's walking around in his robe and Versace uh, uh, slippers and, and, he's, and, he, and he, he, he's pacing the floor. How can I reward that man? How can I reward that man? How can I reward him? And he finally sits down. Now the sun's coming up and in walks Haman. He's freshly shaved. He slept like a, he slept like a angel. And he feels good and he walks in and he thinks I just had the greatest night of my life and tonight I get to do it all over again. I am something special. He walks into the presence of the king. The king looks at him. He's got black bags under his eyes and he says, he says, now, uh, he says, I want to ask you something, Haman. He said, what, what would you suggest that I do? Let's say there's a man in the kingdom that I really want to honor. And Haman, with his egotistic self, is thinking, oh my God. Now, he's about to do a humble brag. Uh, I know it could never be I, but, but oh, king, I w-. come on, y'all. I'm working hard up here. Y'all <laughs> sitting out there just like you at a movie. Where's the popcorn? I preach to myself. This is how I preach. That's how I talk to myself when I read stuff. But he says, what would, what, let's say there was somebody I wanted to bless, Haman. I mean, I really wanted to show honor and show the whole nation this guy is a big deal to me. <laughs> Sir, I would suggest humbly I think you ought to take your robe off, your robe, and put it on him. I think you ought to take your stallion, the steed that you ride on yourself, and you ought to let him ride on it with that robe. I think you ought to take some pipsqueak, some minor, lesser person, and let them guide the bridle of that horse on a rope and walk through the streets and as trumpets are blasting, tell all the people, the man in whom the king honors is before you. And instantly the king said, brilliant. And I could see Haman, oh yes I am, brilliant. And suddenly the king says, hold it, don't play yet. The king says, they're doing their job. I tell them 30 minutes, if a hurricane's happening, come out on the keyboard. But that don't always mean I want you to play. <laughs> You're good, though. I see you. You're good. I know what that means. All right, let me finish. I'm almost there. This is so important. The remedy for worry. He says, the king says, that's brilliant. I love it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do everything you just said, Haman, but do it to Mordecai the Jew. And he said, by the way, I think you're important enough that you should be the one who's leading the horse, screaming the man who the king wants to honor. This is the man on the horse. Well, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but stuff you're worrying about, you've forgotten who your God is. You've forgotten how powerful he is. You've forgotten that when he speaks, seas open. When he speaks, mountains move. When he speaks, demons tremble. And no, the enemy's plot against your life will not be successful. God is fighting for you. Sit down, I'm almost done. So, don't you know how humiliating that was? The man whom the king honors. The man whom the king honors. That night, after a humiliating day, Haman comes to the palace for the final banquet. Queen Esther is there. They eat. The king turns and says, why did you do this? Tell me the real reason. 
What do you want? She said, sir, there is a conspiracy in the land to kill Mordecai, the Jew, and all of his seed. And I don't know if you knew this, king, but I, Esther, I'm a Jew. King is enraged. Stands up because he didn't sleep all night. So he's, 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 you know how you are when you didn't sleep good. Turn to your wife and say, I know how you are when you didn't sleep good. Turn to your husband and say, you're that way all the time. It doesn't matter if you sleep good or not. Can I finish? Here's the finish. He's so angry. He doesn't want to make a, a quick decision. He, he is smart enough to know if I get rid of this guy, it's going to cause me a lot. So he gets up and walks out. He says, who, who, who was it behind this conspiracy? And she says, this one right here, Haman. He's so mad. He's just, if he spit, it killed grass. He's so mad. He walks out of the room trying to pull himself together. And the queen takes off to her bedroom and he follows her. Haman follows her because he's now, now all the tables are turned and he falls on her bed. When she goes into her bedroom, she's sitting on it. He falls on her bed and he starts crying out for mercy. And the king just happened at that time to walk in the bedroom and he sees this guy on the bed with his queen and he says, that I was, I was trying to figure out what to do. Now I know what to do. And the gallows that you prepared for Mordecai, guards, take him out and hang him right now on those same gallows. Now, now let me finish and you can play now. You can play. So here's what I came to say. In a church this size, This 2,600 year old story is not just a piece of history, but it's a reminder that you need to hear that you have a king who has intentional insomnia. He said, I will. He didn't say I can't sleep. He said, I will not sleep or slumber because I'm going to walk the floor. And while you sleep, I am up and I'm planning and I'm plotting your comeback. I'm planning how that the enemy has constructed things that I'm going to turn for your good. I'm going to use them against the very voices that have tried to destroy you. Your king is not asleep. He's active. He has a plan. He's for you. And in a crowd this size, there's some family that's represented that had a heated argument, unkind, cruel words were spoken, maybe even last night. And it looks like the enemy's gone wild in your family. There's somebody else here who's scared of a medical situation. You dread going back to the doctor. The word, the C word, cancer, is tormenting you. You don't know what in the world. And the problem is real and it's being formed. And you feel like you're worried and you're full of anxiety and fear and worry. In a crowd this size, there's some parents that are agonizing over a teenager that's making crazy decisions and you never thought and you get one kid fixed and then another one acts up. How do you know? Because I raised five of them. You get one thing fixed and here's another one and you feel like you're losing your mind and where is God? His name's not even in this family apparently. But he sent me to tell you that the one thing that turned the battle for Esther, the one thing that turned the battle for Mordecai is that the king had intentional insomnia. Listen, worry doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. And if it's causing you grief, if it's causing you pain, if it's causing you anxiety and worry and struggle and anguish, God cares about it and the king can't sleep. 
And he said, he who keeps you, I will not let your foot be removed. And he who keeps you will not slumber or sleep. How many of you are worrying about something? And there's only two reasons why people have insomnia. Something internal or external is bothering them. It may be something internal, it may be a disease, it may be something going on internally, or it may be something externally with people, relationships, job, family, but it's, it's, it's worrying you, tormenting you. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and cast your worry on me, for I can handle it, and your king is not asleep, he's awake. The king can't sleep as long as you have a problem. You don't believe he loves you. You're not a somebody. You're the bride of the king. Stand to your feet all over this room and I want to have a different altar call. I want every teenager, I want every adult, I want every mom, every dad, every businessman, every person who's facing physical situations, medical, whatever the situation that is worrying you silly. I want you, this is a different altar call. You know that if you come here. The Lord said, tell them to bring the worry to the altar. So if you have worry, I want you to get out of your seat and get as close to this stage as you can get. And the same at every campus right where you are. Come on, get out of your seat and bring that issue. Bring that problem. Bring it to the king. Bring it to him in faith. And don't, don't, don't just bring it, but now I want you to say, Lord, I'm going to turn this worrying into warring. And I'm going to lift my hands and I'm going to worship you in the middle of all the stuff, the anxiety, the feelings of worry and fear. I don't have to carry it. God is on the job. He works the midnight shift. God is, the King is awake and He hears your cry. Lift your hands all over this room, all the way up and down those aisles. If it brings you grief, if it brings you worry, if it brings you anxiety, talk to Him about it. Cast it on Him, put it on Him today. He's the God of miracles. about the drugs, worried about the crowd they're running with, worried about the choices, worried about that marriage, that family. Give it to God. That's what church is all about. Give it to God. Give your brother. Give your sister. Give your future. Give your finances. God, I need you. I need you. He's checking the records. He's checking the records. What did the king do? He checked the records. Are you still praising me? Are you still standing in faith? Even when I don't think you Now the Spirit of God is in this room. Release yourself to that Spirit. Let Him bring peace. Let Him bring help. He wanted you to know through this sermon, I see you. I know I've been silent, but I'm moving. I've been quiet, but I'm moving. I've been undercover, but I'm moving. And now you need to praise Him like you believe that you're not a somebody, anybody. You are a child of the Most High God. A member of the royal family. Jesus. Sing it again.
thing about worry is sometimes when you're so filled with worry, you can't really pray with a lot of confidence. Like you're like Esther, you know, you're going in and you believe you kind of going, uh, but, but, but the report says, the situation says, the, the, the evidence says, this says, that says, and you're, and you're, and sometimes you need a Mordecai. Sometimes you need somebody that says, God's with you to remind you, you're not a, you're not a anybody, a somebody. You're a, you, God said, come boldly. He loves you. He's for you. So I want, I want somebody to receive the anointing of Mordecai for the person beside you and just put your hand on their shoulder. I don't care who you are from the top to the bottom. Lay your hand on their shoulder and say, I just encourage you to let go of that worry today. Quit worrying about it. God's on the throne. The king can't sleep. The king can't sleep. He's there. He's moving. He's working. Even when I can't see it. Even when I can't feel it. internally like you need healing you need healing raise your hand if you need a healing it's okay it's okay worry is not weakness worry means you're human raise your hand all right now look for somebody with their hand raised if they need healing only raise your hand if you need healing now touch them and pray for their healing right now they're gonna sing that one more time and pray all the way through this song do one course for healing. Ready? Start praying for healing. 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 Come on, sing it with everything you got. Everything you got. Everything you got. Proclaim it over their physical body. Waymaker. Promise keeper. Sickness. Disease. Get out of her body. Get out of her body. Mountain boots. Life, long life, be released. Be released from infirmity. Sing it one more time. Waymaker, promise keeper. Nothing's impossible. I, I know I'm going too long and you're incredible. Nobody's moving, so that's incredible. And I don't mean to take advantage of it, but I got to tell you, yesterday when I'm putting this little sermon together in my study, I, I get a text and, 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 it's, and it's one of our members. Uh, and um, um, to make a long story short, this person has a sister who is in critical condition, 30 something years old, maybe younger in critical condition, terrible situation. 
I'm right in the middle of this message in my spirit. And a lot of times, you know, I'll do that later. And the Lord prompted me and said, call them now and pray for them. Call them right now and pray for them. And I called and I prayed with that family member. And I said, now I know that the doctors have given up and they said they're brain dead, but here's how I look at it. As long as they're here, we might as well pray for a miracle. And if not, he's still God. That's kind of how I do it. If you call me in, I'm gonna pray for a miracle. And then, you know, if God wants to do different, he's God and I'll still worship him the same. But I said, will you agree with me for that? Yes, pastor, we agree. So help me God. I got a text this morning when I woke up, she came out of the coma. They pulled the, she had, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating one bit. They were so troubled because they didn't think she was ready to go, but they said, she's communicating, she's crying. Oh, that is who you are. Sing it one more time, Waymaker. The king couldn't sleep last night. The king couldn't sleep last night. Let that girl die and go to hell. If you'll pray, if you'll believe, all things are possible. Sing it one more time. Throw your hands up over your worry and receive a warring spirit. Promise keep it. Light in the dark. Sing it just one more time. Just get in somebody. Put your foot on a miracle this morning. text is amazing I won't do it this Sunday but maybe next Sunday I'll read it because it's an amazing text the guy's ecstatic he's going crazy and I didn't have nothing to, all I did was just all God needs is anybody anybody you receive it everybody raise your hand say Jesus wash me in your blood cleanse me make me into your image I receive this message. I'm not a worrier. I'm a warrior. And I want y'all to part like the Red Sea and I'm gonna finish blessing you. I'm gonna put the blessing on you, but part all the way down because I gotta go to the back. I wanna shake hands and say hello to any and all. But here's the blessing. Are you ready for it? Lord, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you peace and take away all that worry because he's with you and the king, he can't sleep over you. He loves you that much. He knows your family and your need and you are blessed. And Lord, bless the Kansas City Chiefs today, I pray in the name of Jesus. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, amen.